Well, hello, creatives, community, and kind folks. Welcome to RPG with DBJ. I am your host, DBJ. And today we are going to talk, we're going to delve back into the OSR versus modern Dungeons and Dragons, um, uh, collectively thought of as Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. And we are going to talk about this Monday, it's Monster Monday, about encounters and three big myths, of maybe mistakes that in terms of encounter building today versus you know old school um us old grognards used to <laughs> make our encounters and um kind of dispel the myths and correct a lot of the what i'm perceiving as mistakes in encounter building and uh we're going to talk about it you know for about an hour but l allow me to lay down a little thesis hey hey everybody <laughs> thanks very much for being here um 6 a.m eastern standard time uh, monday through friday uh ish we try to uh, talk about some simple things uh things on my head on the top of my head and just turn it into a podcast and uh, talk openly probably one of the the only uh open seat of the pants studio podcasts here on the youtubes and and uh twitches that you will ever see all right so here we go the osr versus modern dungeons and dragons and and some of the mistakes and these are my big three there may be more and you may not think of them as mistakes, but allow me to give you my thesis. All right. The first one is uh, random encounters. Uh, the, 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 the disparity, the, the myth of random encounters being so random that it can ruin the, the very uh, setting that you've created. You, you sat down, you got your notes out, maybe you put it on a VTT, you're, you're on a um, a Zoom call. You're meeting in person. You've got your miniatures, and then all of a sudden, a random encounter on some random ass table that you you didn't even really look at ends up ruining the whole thing. That's that's one the the myth of how random encounters are handled in the in old school the OSR versus modern. The second one is is a uh, lethality. It is the idea that. Uh, the OSR is filled with nothing but save or suck abilities and that they they ruin gaming today. And if your character is paralyzed for 10 minutes or um, ends up getting stabbed by a needle and a save or die, that th the game completely ends and there's no way to proceed forward. And it's just a it's just a, a, a constant death fest. And the third one is balance that. Today, you have to have games that are balanced. It has to, how do I balance my encounters? And in an OSR, there were never any balanced encounters. PCs would just turn the corner, find dragons, and just die. All right. So in the OSR, there were a, a number of features. And now, mind you, gaming was very new. So some of these features weren't even uh, verbalized. They weren't even written down, but they were given to us by the way, uh, what we were no, what were called as modules today, they might be called adventure paths. Uh, they were modules, and they they would teach us uh, little elements of encounter building along the way. Now, in the OSR, most creatures were instead of what we today we call CR level, it was HD, and you did know how powerful one creature was to another, and. Like Wayne is saying here, we made encounters by knowing our PC's abilities. Yeah, PC's abilities, strengths and weaknesses, and then using the um, using appropriate encounters we handpicked. We did not rely on some generic formula to think think for us. Exactly. We, in in other words, um, even before session zero was a session zero, if a player picked a thief back back in the day, it was called a thief, not a rogue. That meant that they wanted to sneak around and maybe steal stuff. If someone played a fighter, that meant they wanted to fight things. If someone played a magic user, that meant there, were, it, there would be magic in the encounter. So it wasn't random. It was, hey, I'm going to design an encounter based approximately on what the characters would like to do and, you know, make them look like little badasses. And then what they can't encounter, which is like, yeah, this is going to be a problem for them. And then we just mix and match all of those. And the way modules got around that was, hey, listen, if you go on this adventure, it's up to you how you ha handle it. There was there were no prescribed 
there was no such thing as a prescribed encounter. It was, here's a situation, and then the players then chose how to handle their characters to navigate past that situation. Yeah, when he, when he says there should be encounters in world setting that PCs, th this is another part of the OSR that um, I believe is missing from modern gaming, uh, not just encounter building, but modern gaming in general. And Wayne says there should be encounters in a world setting that PCs are not ready for or cannot overcome. That's keeping things more realistic, a word I don't hear associated with games anymore. Then, yeah. So he here's, here's, here's the deal. When an encounter happened, in, especially in old school gaming, encounters did not mean a fight. An encounter was a situation, a problem, a situation, a, a, an obstacle, a hazard, um, a, a thing in front of the player characters that they had to navigate around. So if they were walking, as an example, walking through the woods and you had an encounter with six ogres. It didn't matter what level the player characters were. You had an encounter with six ogres. Now, that encounter could be them hearing the noise of the ogres because of, of they were encamped or they're walking through the woods. Could the players stay quiet and let the ogres pass? Of course. Could they follow the ogres and see what they were talking about? Maybe they had a, maybe they captured uh, the MacGuffin, you know, innocence from a village or stole something. Maybe. M maybe the player characters loop back and want to then encounter the ogres after they've already passed, even though they, the PCs may have had three more encounters, you know, after that. It was, here's a situation, the PCs d decide how to deal with it, and then we moved on. And because in the OSR, this idea of lethality, that characters were constantly dying, was that they, have, a lot of times, they either avoided situations or created circumstances to allow them to overcome one situation by using details from the from the past situations and encounters and objects and all the interactions and interconnectivity to allow them to have some sort of um, numerical or narrative success going forward. So did the PCs uh, make friends with a, you know, the lizard folk in the village yesterday so that they would travel with them today to encounter those those ogres? Maybe. Maybe the player characters befriended uh, a, a wizard or some kind of uh, magical being that would give them some form of camouflage or invisibility or, or charm. Or maybe they picked up one of those um, very common OSR magic items that were one-use items that allowed them to have a powerful impact but it was a one use item it was a you you it had one charge maybe maybe possibly a few more charges or some kind of randomized effect and maybe it could charm the ogres or make an illusion um or just <laughs> create a very powerful explosion to to get rid of three of the the six ogres and whatnot when he goes on to say i don't see a lot of world play going on uh but rather single adventures yeah a bit different because the single adventure should be able to overcome, uh, be able to be overcome in some way, not necessarily via combat. And strangely enough, when it comes to the words encounter and experience today, we think of it in video game terminology. That if you play a character in a video game, even prior to even loading up the video game, you get to decide how difficult the video game is. And then when you're in it, many times they are designed. To they are designed to be overcome by the character's capabilities at that very moment. Now, it could be they, they may um, adjust it slightly by the character uh, in the video game may need to pick up an item or be charged by a particular element in the video game to overcome or surpass that level. But most of the time, it's based it's balanced based on who's involved in at that moment. And... I, I see in many forums where they'll say, well, a certain player character couldn't be here. It used to be five of us. Now it's four. Now it throws off my encounter balance. And in, in OSR, it didn't, adventures weren't designed for a specific number of players and specific level. It would just say, designed for five to seven characters of level four to six. 
And it was like a lot of variation in there. And if you didn't have the capabilities to 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 beat off the dragon, then you just didn't have those capabilities. You navigated around it. You figured out how to parlay. So let's get into let's get into uh, flow into random encounters. Random encounters in the OSR weren't quite as random as you think they were. N- not not in the sense of of this idea of picking up a random chart rolling random dice to have a random event and then rolling your eyes and going, oh, this random, I got to in- introduce this random thing into my preset world and this sucks. No, 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 no. Random tables, 99% of the time in a in a an adventure module that was put together, those random tables were designed for that encounter. So if the adventure took place in a swamp, the random encounter table... Y- 99% of the time involved swamp-like creatures. Now, if you picked up a third-party item, uh, maybe you went online and, and went to uh, plenty of websites and blogs where people make excellent random charts. Maybe there was a um, an old adventure you had with the mountains and you wanted to take that, that and use it in your swamp. Sure, maybe it didn't fit quite naturally. But also, guess what? We were also pretty creative. So if you had a random chart and it it didn't have a lot of detail in it. Your creativity didn't stop when you rolled the dice and created and and introduced a random encounter. What happened was if there were, I'm just gonna make up orcs, then <laughs> then those orcs would be swamp orcs, and you would describe them within your world. If you were in the mountains, they was might be mountain orcs, or you could go the opposite and introduced orcs that weren't adapted to the swamp and they're wandering around like well like um adventurers and they're going about their way and, and getting all pissed off with swatting or gnats away so we would role play those monsters which brings us to another element of random encounters that random encounters were just nothing but <laughs> you guys are so silly random encounters are nothing but like uh resource draining yes but no Random encounters technically were bits and pieces of your setting material introduced to the players without having to um, do a big giant lore drop. drop. So let me exa- let me explain to you a random table and see where you think this takes place in. Um, orc raiders riding on giant scorpions. Um, uh, elven nomads riding on the back of of uh, sidewinder snakes maybe there's a an encounter with a sandstorm maybe there's an encounter with quicksand um it, listen you automatically know that i'm talking about encounters in maybe an accursed desert i i like to visit the accursed desert every now and again so you have these encounters in this accursed desert great also with random encounters um with describing the world that you're in an encounter is an encounter. It doesn't mean it's a fight. Maybe they come across nomads that are just peaceful or refugees or individuals that are starving or injured or hurt or lost. Maybe they come across nobles traveling along their way, et cetera, et cetera. It random encounters describe the setting and allow the player characters to gain some knowledge by talking to NPCs, um, Oftentimes with those random encounters, the player characters didn't engage in those random encounters, right? So if they saw random, um, you know, you know, adventuring orcs traveling through the swamp and just being pissed off that they're being uh, bit up by, you, you know, gnats and, and one of the orcs gets, you know, grabbed by an alligator and dragged down, the player characters didn't have to engage. They Maybe they hide behind the trees and they remain hiding while they watch them go by, um, listening to the conversations, g- gaining little bits and pieces of information. And dare I say, uh-oh, I'm going to say the word, they role-played. The dungeon master was allowed to role-play the monsters and how they interacted. Maybe those orcs didn't want to fight themselves. Tons of monsters, and we're going to, I'm going to bring up the word morale, Lots of encounters with with monsters in terms of le- the lethality. It didn't become a lethal encounter because either player characters wanted to disengage, they didn't want to die, and the monsters wanted to disengage because they didn't want to die. And there was actually a mechanical ability called uh, a mechanical feature 
called morale. And it was a tool in the dungeon master's hand to say, hey, you know what? These orc raiders, they want to live. And the player characters are very powerful. Maybe they want to parlay. Uh, they Maybe they want to run or trade or say, hey, let's not fight any longer or give up some information or hand over their ill-gotten gains or give them a uh, point them in the correct direction because the player characters themselves are lost and so on. It was all about role playing. And the OSR taught game masters to role play all of the monsters that they included in their encounter. Now, does that mean that there were some monsters like beasts and animals and zombies and, and constructs that didn't talk? Sure. But that didn't mean you didn't role play them. Big old owl bears don't like to get stabbed in the buttocks by spears. They would run off. Giant flying monsters would swoop in like giant owls or eagles or something would fly in and try to snatch a objects or or whatever from the player characters and then fly off and that might be the, the whole encounter is w literally one round of combat and it would fly off so random encounters weren't so random lastly many of the random encounter tables especially in dungeons there weren't random monsters just wandering around they were uh, entrenched monsters in the dungeon that happened to leave the room the, the air quotes locked door room that they were in to walk around the dungeon, either searching for food, attacking other denizens in the dungeon or um, going on patrol or any number of reasons for maybe resetting those traps that the PCs triggered and things like that of uh, taking care of the dungeon. So, yeah. Uh, so anyway, our co-hosts have to say, yeah, dead man brings up dark sun encounters. Um, dark Sun had tons of, but random encounters as the PCs traveled across the, you know, the, the um, destroyed desolate landscapes and they would encounter things. And a lot, many times in those encounters, the PCs want something out of this encounter. It, and it could be killing the monsters. It could be treasure. It may be information. It may be, you know, being hidden, um, finding a, a way inside of um, an ally to allow them to, past the, the territory to get into a new re region. And then in the random encounter, the monsters or NPCs or whatever want something from that as well. Maybe they start following the PCs. Maybe they, they, they want to send back word that there are these strange adventurers and all that. It was about role-playing them. Um, Mike says, I can't remember the last time PCs hid from a wandering encounter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A preset encounter? Yes. A random one? Nope. Um, is it was it a resource drain? Sure, sure. But was it also a way for the player characters to gain something before they tripped over <laughs> tripped over themselves into a very dangerous situation as well? Maybe they are warned about an upcoming Medusa. They're warned about the invisible stalker that the wizard sent after an NPC. Maybe they are warned about the Hydra hiding in the swamp that the player characters would have never learned about before. Yet, yeah, yeah, um. Yeah, Timothy says, yeah, morale checks are 100% realistic. Not every creature is willing to fight to the death. And, and we also remember in the OSR, it was all about consequences. So let me rewind back to those six ogres that the PCs decide to hide from. Maybe those ogres were going to meet and reinforce a, an enemy group that the player characters are on their way to encounter in the first place, right? So it wasn't just about, it wasn't just about um, a random encounter, one and done, and we're not going to revisit it. When the player characters went into the dungeon, they, the the dungeon, and the dungeon may be underground, it may be a deserted island, that desert, that swamp, those mountains, and the minute the player characters involved themselves, they started to change, change the, the, the um, uneasy balance between all the denizens that live there. And if the player characters befriended the ogres, the other things that live there would have a different reaction than if the players ran from those same ogres or, or slayed those ogres or uh, what, whatever have you, or hid from those ogres and let them know when they met the lizard folk that's in the swamp and say, Hey, listen, there's like six other ogres out there. You need to watch out. And the lizard folk might go, Oh, Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Maybe we'll let you pass or we'll exchange items or whatever. When he says, oh, I absolutely dislike the tendency to see games, to see, um, 
seeing games I watched today where all the monsters basically fight to the end as if they're unintelligent fighting machines. And especially what was taught to us in a lot of those adventures, those random, air quotes, random creatures belonged in that realm. So if there were mindless creatures, let's say dire wolves or something, maybe those dire wolves belonged to the orc raiders that the PCs didn't see on the, on the horizon or, you know, past this last obstacle or something, they belonged there. And it could be that again, creatures were diseased, lost, wounded, hunting. Um, they, if remove the player characters and the monsters had their own agendas. Now, sure. Were, were there some strange, like, wait a minute, why are there monsters behind a locked door? How would they eat and feed themselves? Was there a little bit of that? Sure, but over time, as adventure design be began getting more sophisticated, even back in, in um, the uh, mid-80s to early 90s, this was a, a the, the idea of having morale, the idea of having monsters having various levels of, of hit points and such, and details as to why, you know, this these particular orcs were starving because they got pushed out of their home by um, the, the wizard and their um, allies from the outer plains. There was a reason why that. <laughs> yeah, Wade's like honey badgers. Yeah, honey badgers. No morale role for this creature. It always chooses to fight until you're dead. And th the reason there there was a mechanical tactic for players to elicit reactions out of monsters to win by causing them to lose their morale. So instead of fighting creatures until you, all the hit points were gone, players knew they, and this was a mechanical feature of the game. They knew that, Hey, if we eliminate half of our enemies, instead of six ogres, we get them down to three, boom, morale check. Maybe we get the others to run because there's no way we're going to survive fighting six ogres. Right. Um, Hey, if we, uh, and I'm going to get to our, to our last thing about creative solutions. Hey, if we trick, hide, um, ambush, um, you use our, our um, um, one and done abilities, maybe we can get elicit a morale reaction to get them to run so that we don't need to expend other resources like our hit points and our spell slots and things like that. Yeah, Mike says, PCs also tend to go from lawful good Mary, Mary Sunshine to Tony Soprano uh, the second the talk of survivors comes up. Yeah, yeah. There, there used to be a... <laughs> there used to be a lot of, like, I used to be a farmer. Now I know how to torture people in, in the OSR, too. There, there was some soci sociopathic tendencies from our, uh, from our player characters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I remember early on as players, we used to, like, like, try to cut that off in the beginning like yeah you don't have to torture every goblin to get information from them why don't you just talk to them <laughs> mm -mm -mm. dead man mentions that um in ad and d had morale ratings for all mindful creatures they sure did uh they absolutely did and then by that by that standard the idea of role playing the monsters in their actions and reactions absolutely positively like became a part of the the old school gaming it was like oh maybe the maybe the pack of wolves will run if someone starts you know taking a torch and trying to scare them away maybe the 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 harpies will uh you know the group of harpies will fly if one or two of them is shot down out the air by arrows or something you know um yep Mm -mm -mm. Mike says that as an improv improvisational DM, I use wandering encounters to seed plot points. Oh, hell's yes, <laughs> right? I use one. Um, let's use, you know, um, ribbit, ribbit, whoosh from out of the, out of the box of encounters. Okay. Uh, bullywogs riding giant toads attack. They're led by a half dragon bullywog. That means there's a black dragon in a vast swamp. Listen, the, the idea that, um, the idea that, the one encounter leads to another was absolutely part of the OSR. If you encountered bugbears, you're just like, oh man, I bet there's a bugbear army nearby, right? It, that was a thing, or not necessarily an all bugbear army, but they might be a, a forward scout group connected to a bigger, 
you know, thing where it might be bugbears are scouting with a couple of goblins and then it's an orc encampment and then there's like hobgoblins and there's a big army there and maybe they've got trolls in their group and then there's other monsters. But yeah, it one thing led to another. Yeah, because half dragons have to come from somewhere. Yeah, those 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 pesky dragons. All right, so here we go. All right, so here <laughs> here we go with the 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 spam comment. Okay, here we go. Uh, Rajitsu says a wise DM would use one white and then make it possible for that level to be recovered, whether he made a restoration scroll or high level priest available. Um, uh, Rajitsu is talking about level drain. So in it was pretty level drain was pretty damn harsh in the OSR. If you if you encountered a level draining creature, you literally lost a level of your character. That was pretty that, and it was permanent. So it was pretty harsh. Um but it, there was also either prior to meeting that level draining creature like a white or wraith whites there were some others, not mummies. Ah, I can't remember the other ones that that were like the most common. But you may encounter or or the opportunity to encounter maybe a nomadic group or whatever to find a priest to be able to cure that would be inserted in there. Now, if the if the PCs wanted to murder kill the 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 group that had the ability for them to regain a level, that was up to them. You you didn't know. You just threw it in there. Anyway, it goes on to say. In the worst case scenario, the drained PC would rest in a town while a replacement PC or NPC temporarily took up their role. Yeah, we don't talk about uh, henchmen, retainers, hirelings. We don't have that's really like disappeared completely. It's more or less, it's like the three, four, five PCs, and that's it. Uh, one white and a subsequent healing of, of, of so grievous an injury was an adventure unto itself. Yeah, think Frodo getting scarred by the Nazgul. Yep. Yep. Those side adventures became became another adventure unto themselves. Yep. The better DMs learn how to ration the suffering. <laughs> what a what a term to ration the suffering and to pair that suffering with meaningful drama, at least until the PCs reach those higher tiers of power. What a I like that term, ration of suffering. Wow. Wow. Okay. I I can't cannot get credit for that. <laughs> Rajitsu, I really um or it could be Ragitsu. But anyway, um, the idea that that the player characters could suffer and have these long-term sufferings also meant that there were ways for PCs to overcome them. For example, if the PCs are heading to the mountains and they encountered a number of, of fire-related encounters, meaning like maybe there were NPCs that had things to protect the PCs with fire, they fought smaller monsters that had fire-like elements to them, then this gave them clues that when they got to the mountain, there's probably going to be something like fire elemental and a free, most likely a red, uh, ancient red dragon or whatever. And the player characters could then go, hey, you know what? This person was selling three potions of fire resistance or something. I wonder why, since they were in the swamp, <laughs> right? And it's like, yeah, that th this is a hint that there are other things ahead. Wayne says, how the hell does he type so fast? I could barely keep up. I'm impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed too. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. I, I, I uh, thank you very much there, uh, Rajisu, by the way, for the comment. Uh, I tend to stay away from the spamming, but, but I get what you were trying to say. There's only so many, there's only so many characters to describe. That's why I like to be here and kind of take what you guys uh, have to say and expand upon it uh, because other people are probably thinking the same thing. Yeah, Rawl says, oh, whites. Yeah, there <laughs> it sounds like I'm being it sounds like I'm being racist. Anyway, uh, says, oh whites, yeah. Level drain is one mechanic I don't uh, I don't use even as an old school DM. Yeah, uh whites, wraiths, level draining. It was pretty harsh. It was yeah, but like Registus says, make an adventure out of it. Like that was the whole point of long-term effects, whether it was losing an eye or a limb or being cursed. Remember, in, o in OSR being cursed was horrible horrible um you'd pick up cursed magic items everywhere there were uh creatures that could curse you or dungeons that where if you went inside of them and you read the thing wrong or opened up the door you would get cursed and that curse would last for levels um and and it became an adventure to remove 
uh, certain types of poisons, curses, diseases, level drain, um, etc. And you know, it wasn't save or suck so much as as we are being prepped to know that before the save or suck happens, we we know how to uh, deal with it or at least run away from it. Um, if there was a lot of fire and acid, we knew as players that when before we got to that fiery acid type of encounter, that at least we should be prepared so that we knew before those dice hit the table that it was going to be safe or suck. <laughs> Mike's like, Mike, yeah, Mike says, Ration of Suffering was a black metal band cover. I know. <laughs> yeah, I see it. Yeah, Ration of Suffering. <laughs> I don't have any hit dice. Dead Man says, even worse than whites, ghosts age you. Ooh, forgot about that. Yeah. Ghosts age you five to ten years per hit. Shadows drain strength, 1d4 strength per hit, which which was an, an easy kill. A ghost had an easy kill ability. Many other creatures also drain other things. And one of the great, and I'm going to talk about this ration of suffering. One of the great things about having creatures that drained and affected the PCs in many ways was that there never became a narrowing funnel of vectors of, of conflict. In current Dungeons & Dragons, we only have hit points. Or very rarely do we go outside of the hit point, out of, outside of the hit point, um... Um, percentages of success and failure the meaning that hit points are basically a countdown timer and hit points act as a countdown timer for damage and suffering if i've got 60 hit points i know that i'm halfway there if i get to 30 if i've got five hit points left and the creature does 20 hit points per hit i know that my countdown timer is going to end and in many ways level drain ability drain um, having consequences of like losing limbs and and losing your mind and level drain and all that kind of stuff meant that that no matter how protected any player character was against one vector of damage, armor class and hit points, there was always another way that something could come around the corner, strike them and limit them. And then PCs had to be creative in terms of either protecting themselves, like finding silvered weapons against you know, lycanthropes, or whether it's finding um, a way to overcome, you know, uh, hypnotism or mind control or petrification and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, Rawl, <laughs> um, Rawl says, uh, oh, I don't stay away from um, anything else, like stat loss, hit dice loss, vile curses that can, that can decommission a character for a long time. I use it all, but level drain is where I draw the line. Not a problem. And and because we had, if you had three players, there was a good chance you could have up to eight to ten uh, extra individuals on the battlefield that the player characters had control of, whether they were henchmen, hirelings, retainers, etc. And when you're when one character was out of commission, another one would just slip in their place, as was mentioned before. Um, lastly, I'll say that that what. Another issue that we often don't see today that was in counter building in OSR is, and we've already been talking about it, are creative problem solving, being creative, whether players used an illusion plus sound effects and, and some of their magic items or skills to make the, those ogres afraid that there was a, another giant size monstrous beast in the in the, the swamp or something to scare them away whether the player characters pull something out to parlay with the lizard folk instead of fighting them to trade maybe or heck i remember having a game where it was a random encounter it was it was literally the the beginning of the we're on the road and bandits attack and one of the players started talking about just insert it like oh man i know i owed you money before and i was like i don't we didn't come up with this and inserted their own player's background into the encounter. And then they end up getting allies that were really backstabbers, but it was this cool interaction during this adventure. And it was like, yeah, creative problem solving. And 
not looking at what your char player character's capabilities are, not looking at what spell effects were, but coming up with creative solutions is a was a great way. Did would one player, the thief in the group, now known as the rogue, go off into distance and make noise to draw the monsters out of the rooms so the PCs could sneak in and start stealing the stuff? Yeah, that's create that's being creative. Would would player characters start fires or flood dungeons or um, any number of of ways to solve a situation in the middle of combat, even right? Um, those kobolds that had all those traps that the PCs avoided running backwards and having their enemies fall into the same traps that they found absolutely was a creative solution. Uh, um, uh, give PCs giving themselves up and pretending that they were uh, pretending to be captured, uh, knowing that they could escape very easily to get into the bowels of a, of a, um, you know, deep dungeon or something like that was, was a, a possible way. Um, hiding amongst the dead and pretend playing like you're dead was an easy thing to do. Uh, all, all these number of things, things that would leaving food out for, for um, hungry monsters to eat while the PCs ran away. Uh, I remember a player character wanting to carry around the dead bodies of goblins for, for just such occasions and whatnot. It was pretty ridiculous, but yeah, having, having creative methods to get out of things and being dungeon masters and allowing that creativity to shine instead of going, well, the rules say you can only get out of petrification with this one spell instead of going, oh, well, you know what? They could go back to that, you know, parlay with that nomadic tribe. I bet they encountered the Medusa or the, or the basilisks or something plenty of times. I bet they have something with them, you know. Uh, yeah, Dead Man says there's even a monster in 3.0 D&D that caused, made you famished or could deplete your carried food oh there were plenty of of things that would defeat your food and water uh would poison it or rot it or corrupt it or something or maybe being in the presence of that monster would cause that which also gave pe player characters the ability to sense whether something was around like like um if the player character's food began to rot very quickly they knew that a, a particular type of monster was within that region um, same thing with using certain type of spell effects or even some monsters would be affected by other monsters. Pl plenty of times in OSR, monsters didn't get along and the p player characters could could twist that interaction to their benefit. It was pretty cool. Um, Rajitsu says you can add charm person to the list of potential saver suck effects. Oh, yeah. Charm person, hypnotism, paralysis effects, polymorph effects, um, uh, uh, petrification effects uh, uh paralysis effects from creatures monsters creatures and monsters poisons spell effects were, were a thing but anyway um believe it or not some players would rather be mind controlled than lose a level even if having their will subverted could cause a plethora of problems for the rest of the party i wonder if this is why the duration of charm person was radically shortened from osr to modern DD. uh i i kind i agree with you on that that plenty of okay so sometimes and this could be a whole subject unto itself in game design. Sometimes we have inadvertent interactions with our game rules that the designers didn't expect. So an example would be an example is level drain was so harsh that players would rather have other effects happen to, the, happen to them than being level drained. Petrification was up there. I, honestly, if you were like fifth or sixth level and below, I think in the OSR, now I think it's a, it's pretty much third level or below in modern d and I think you could wipe petrification out pretty quick um, if it was permanent. But there were some permanent effects that were so bad that no one minded sitting out of the game for 10 minutes because you were paralyzed by ghouls or something and being charmed temporarily or something like that. And being charmed actually led to other adventures. Vampire charms a PC, takes that PC with them. Now here's the chance to go after and rescue the PC, right? Because you, you had backup characters. So in many ways, the, the idea that the, the idea that something was so bad we would rather encounter something else, I don't disagree with you on that. Um, um, I don't disagree with you that at all. But the fact that 
charming, pe- in modern day, charming petrification, poisons and things have li- such limited durations that they only last in, in seconds because you get a next saving throw for the next round or something like that, that the saver suck was was went to the such opposite degree that now players even complain if they're stunned for a number of rounds or or paralyzed for a number of rounds. They they fold their arms and are just like, this is stupid. I can't in- interact with the game next round. Um, yeah, yeah. As players, it was just like, oh, good, 10 minutes, great. I get a pee break, <laughs> you know? Oh, man. I, I don't disagree with their, um, uh, their uh, Raji. Yeah, uh, Roka mentions that creative problem solving is the very core of OSR. Oh, oh, yeah. Side note, how many times did we go on adventures where we brought with us ball bearings, sand, powder, um, 10-foot poles, chickens, uh, 50 feet of rope, um, um, what is it, Um, a flint um, striking element to make fires, uh, a mirror, a prism, or a magnifying glass, a needle and thread, all these, all, listen, all these things, feathers, we used we used all those little things in adventure because it would it meant life or death. I, I can describe to you why those things were important. Maybe that's a that'll be another a, another aspect. But yeah, putting feathers on doorknobs, using needle and thread to try to slip like things down or sew things together, or use thread to. I mean, there were so many ball bearings to see if the floors were sloped, um, powder next to to um, areas in the room to see if wind was coming by secret doors. It was a whole big thing that we would do. Everybody carried a couple of 10 foot pole. I mean, technically a staff was a 10 foot pole, but yeah, 10 foot pulling our ways through stuff was funny. Uh, anyway, go going on to, for uh, Roka's comment here, uh, resources are in, inconspicuous as <laughs> soap might be useful. <laughs> yeah. Enemies climbing from downhill, toss soap water and make them slip back down. Yeah. Oh, man. We would come up with so many things like using um, modern day scientific reactions for other things. I remember a player character. Um, I don't know if you guys understand how to make ice cream. But you take like rock salt, uh, you, rock salt and, and ice, and you, and you turn the thing in the middle, and you have cream and stuff. Anyway, player character created ice cream, and started giving it uh, giving it away to monsters, <laughs> and it was hilarious. <laughs> we were talking about making like an ice cream um um uh, uh, ice cream truck and on a flying carpet, and it was it was hilarious. But anyway, he created ice cream. And the the monsters would start following the PCs because of the sweetness, and it was hilarious. But it was a great way to solve a problem, though. He's like, I'm going to give out treats. <laughs> it's like, okay, I guess. Wayne says, modify the effect of the undead so it can be cured. Yeah, might require clerical help at some cost. Might really, excuse me, um, uh, might really never left those things as permanent effects because I very much hate it when it happened to me. Now, it depends on what we mean by permanent, right? Um, it, <laughs> yeah, Rick, 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 your hands is like coming up on the on the fifteen minutes. Yeah, the fifteen minute mark at the end of the show where where all the best ideas come out, which is funny. But uh, what what Wayne is talking about is like you you know one of the, the default ways to cure something was to kill the creature that caused the effect in the first place. So like if you were petrified by a basilisk if you took out the basilisk you could use its glands or something to get the character back or if it was a ghost that aged you years and i know this doesn't seem strange but back in the day you needed to know the age of your character because there were monsters and other effects that would age your character i think there were even spells if i'm not mistaken that had random tables on it that if you rolled a particularly bad it would age your character by using that that uh, special ability. And yeah, that, that was even a way because there were even charts that if you, if your character became a certain age, if you went from adolescent to, you know, mature, mature to middle age, middle age to, to elderly and such, your stats would start to change. Yeah. Thank you so much there. Uh, Rickard says, save or suck is just bad game design. It doesn't tell a story nor adds anything to the player who now sucks. Well, um, I, 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 
agree with it instantly. I disagree with the story elements because in OSR, before that happened, there were story elements that led up to that effect, right? It wasn't turn the corner, see the basilisk, now you're petrified and your character's done. It was, we were given five, 10, 15 different clues as to what happened to find a panacea for the effect that's going to happen before the save or suck happened in the first place. And in the OSR, that was a thing. Why Why would players keep, I don't know, um, um, anti-venom potions, even though they're fighting an undead? It was because they knew at some point later on in their adventure career that they would encounter things that had poison. You know, same thing like, hey, we're in the swamp. We found a, we made friends with a, a nomadic tribe that has um, something against, uh, some resistances against acid. Oh, that must mean there's black dragons out here. Let's keep that with us because we know we're going to go up against a thing that's going to suck very much. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have the day off. No, 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 no. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, I, I would love to do this longer than I can, but I do this before work, which is strange. It's like, it's like my coffee. Yeah. And, and also let's, let's remember, uh, cause the guy's talking about the save or suck thing. Also remember gaming groups, even if there were three players, you didn't have three characters. You had more than that. And the, the fact that a player, the fact that a character would go down didn't stop the play going forward. That player could pick up an NPC or they had a player on standby. I mean, excuse me, that player had a character on standby to come in. Or um, a lot of times, like especially in DCC, Dungeon Crawl Classics, as you go through some of these adventures, you would find captured NPCs and you could absolutely pull one of those out turn him into a character, and then keep playing. So the idea that you had a churn going on in the OSR was also a thing. It wasn't, oh, my character's dead, fold arms, pout, this game is stupid. It was, yeah, my character died, I did something stupid. Or, listen, there was a lot of self-sacrifice too. Let's not get it twisted. There was a lot of self-sacrifice. So, yeah, that was a thing. Ooh, you guys, um, mm -mm -mm. Oh, I remember that creature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and I could never remember how to pronounce. I always mispronounced. Uh, I always put the Im improper emphasis on the incorrect in syllable when I <laughs> talked about that creature. Oh man, Mike says back in the day, players would rather die than lose agency. Yeah, I can remember um, um, old characters finding a way to self destruct rather than obey the will of others. That said, save or suck moments create the most complaints. I agree. Now, now remember, this is OSR, so things start to change over time. We, we began to see ways to figure our way out of the save or suck situation, mainly because it involved, um, if it involved nuance. And sometimes if people don't understand what nuance is, then it just became roll the corner, make a save and die. Yep, Mike says, yep, one roll, petrified, one roll, dead from poison, one roll, disintegrated, yep, one roll, paralyzed. That was an argument waiting waiting to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, has it gone the other, far the other way? Yeah. And and like I said, sometimes there's in, unintended consequences, right? So the, the character would get petrified, sucks. You That became an adventure unto itself. So players would find and try to go along and go, there's got to be a way to get our, our favorite character back into our group. They would find the anti-petrification thing and then come back. Yeah, when he says modern day scientific, I remember an article in Dragon about the physics of a fireball. We tended to be very realistic in our games. Yeah, and, and that was, I mean, were there arguments at tables because you didn't have rules on these things? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. It was a pretty silly creature. I, although I think it has some mythological, it has some mythological uh, origins to it. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, Rickard um, says part one. Fellow player in a recent game uh, got hit by power word stun and didn't get to do anything for five rounds of of the four other players. So think twenty minutes of of non acting. Yeah. Um, Part two, as we only have combat ever, 
every three sessions, they essentially missed out on combat for six sessions. Not stories told, no way to get him out of it, just hoping he rolled high on his bad save stat. Well, okay, and and true, but here's, oh, well, I'm sorry, comment goes on. Um, part three, there's no su there's so much better ways to add tension, making that player be creative or make a story or RP session challenge to get out of said effect other than the mercy of a die roll. Now, here's here's something else, unintended consequences, that has happened in modern gaming is that players didn't, players didn't have stacked abilities that allowed them to act multiple times in a round. So today it's become a norm that players have a minimum of three actions per round. Back in the day, you had like one and then you gained levels and you might get two every other round and then you got three. And so actions became like, what are you going to do? Boom. What are you going to do? Boom. What are you going to do? And then it, it cycled around today. It's what are you going to do? I'm going to move. And I'm going to attack. I'm going to use my bonus action to do this other thing. Oh, I've also got, uh, I summoned other creatures, so they're going to act. So I'm going to get them to act. And then I'm going to use my class ability. It gives me an, uh, an additional action from being a fighter, an action surge. So then I'm going to do that. And then after you, you do this three plus actions for one player, then you move on to the next person who's got three actions. And it, if you find somebody that's not prepared, it slowed it down a lot. Back in the day, you didn't. The, the action surge economy churned much faster. So I think that was another unintended consequence of game design as well. Uh, Mike says, random tables in OSR uh, module reflected the contents of that danger. Yep, some modules would account for room contents of, of your randomly encountered monsters related to that room. Exactly, exactly. You know, the, the, the bandit group that had the anti-petrification salves or elixir wasn't random right because a player character would grab it and go well we're not fighting any petrification monsters stick it into the pack and then three encounters later encountered a basilisk right and now wh whether the pcs would would remember that or not was was something else but it taught us that like example a goblin guard post might be empty if the party killed goblins earlier in a random encounter absolutely those monsters that randomly ran around might be leave a room to make that room empty for the PCs to go, oh, now that they're wandering, maybe they came from someplace else. Yep, and King says there's lots of mythology out there. And, and King, you had another comment earlier here, and I think I skipped past it, but damn it. I can't find it. Okay. Um, the, what is Dead Man saying here? Okay, here we go. Yeah, the, the cat, Cato. The Catoblipus, 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 anyway, is a four-legged bull-like creature with a very large and heavy head. Because of the weight of its head, it can only look down. Catoblipus is Greek for that which looks downward. It has a long mane that hangs over its eyes, which are red and bloodshot. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, and when it looked up at you, it would, it would, uh, it had like a death stare or something like that. It was weird. So, Long story short, let, let's summarize this up because we're getting to the end here, that um, this being Monster Monday was that OSR design was we would role play the monsters, random encounters weren't so as, as random as you think they were, and balance wasn't a thing so that players knew that when no matter what the, the next encounter was, that they had to be careful and they... Yeah, <laughs> it kills you with his ugliness. There was a um, Mighty Might and Yuck was a cartoon that I remember where I always thought that was pretty hilarious, where Yuck had a little thing on his head and we lifted it up and enemies would see his face and he's like, ugh, and Mighty Might could shrink down. Uh, anyway, pretty silly. Um, but yeah, the 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 idea that we would that we would actually, um role play the encounter knowing that the next encounter we didn't know whether the creature on the other side was far more powerful than us and every encounter didn't lead to a fight if third level characters if you rolled on a table and there was a ancient dragon it didn't mean there was going to be a fight maybe the dragon just ignores the pcs because they're under them maybe they would parlay maybe the po most very powerful creature in the pcs they, each side knew listen i could kill you easily so here's what I'm going to do. 
I'll make a deal with you. Why don't you go over to this left side of the dungeon to go get the thing for me, and then I'll give you this thing and give you let you pass to get to this other area. It was a lot of that. It was a lot of parlay. It was a lot of a lot of hiding and sneaking and dealing and all that kind of stuff. Heck, even self-sacrificing and stuff, such. Uh, Rickard says small action pool still wouldn't have helped that player. Um, and I will forever hold that there is bad game design. It's like saying no in improv and not even no, but oh yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, th things always shift and change, but sometimes you can have unintended consequences by solving the problem. It's almost like um, it's like um, damming up a river, right? You could dam up a river, which creates a solution to, hey, we need to make a power plant or we need to collect fish or things like that, which all which solves an issue that the people had in the first place, which also creates a problem on the other end. And so sometimes that pendulum swing goes from bad, bad game design on one side to bad game design on the other side, right, where it goes from save or suck to it kind of doesn't even matter anymore all it takes is another die roll and you're done and you're out of it then then it, then the threat doesn't become anything and there's a middle ground i think in it uh but again that that stuff happens all the time and king says older dnd reminds me of shadowrun where if you're fighting it means you screwed up maybe i said that before yeah 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 there uh it, there was a a bit of that it wasn't that there wasn't fighting there was fighting in, in OSR. I think people think that it was all parlay and negotiation and hiding. It wasn't that there wasn't fighting because remember, fighting elicited morale checks. So, but you could, it was selectively choosing how you engaged in a fight to make that fight better for you, whether it was using um, tight spaces or using illusions or surprise or um, some of the elements, again, those one shot elements that you got before, Hey, that bottle of sticky ointment or something, we can throw that at the enemy right now and it will use it. Or, uh, uh, there was a bottle of ever smoke. There was, there were all these really weird, strange magic items. There were uh, bits of equipment that you could get and things like that. So, yeah. And, and so I don't disagree with you there. Um, the, disagree with you, Rickard. I just think that, um, we get unintended consequences by solving a problem by creating another problem on the other end of it. And, uh, and we're living with that today. Uh, it says, thank you all for the chat. Love the minds that come here. Hurts my tiny brain, but that's a good thing, right? Good day, DBJ and every, all the hosts. Thank you very much as well for you guys. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, you, you, you'll see some very slight changes come to the channel. Uh, I, I, it's difficult for me to like, I see, I would love to leave here and then get into the discord or do some like private or like membership only videos and things like that. One one day, one one of these days, the, the number of hours I was working over the last two two and a half years to now has like halved, which I love. I'm getting, I'm, I feel like I'm a human being, not doing 70, 75 hour work weeks plus. It was horrible. So yeah, that's the thing as well. Um, so yeah, you get some changes like. I turned a lot of my playlists into podcasts now because uh, YouTube is now starting the podcast uh, format. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Um, I'll be doing little bits and pieces like doing talking about OSR. Level Up has gotten a lot of attention on the channel, so we'll do a little bit of that as well. Um, there's some other things that I feel like in the community that we might not be touching upon. Um, um, also, uh, I you you notice that I haven't talked about like um, I'm not a big big let's let's every day do a live stream that beats up on watsy kind of thing i think some of it's a little bit ridiculous because it's like um especially this last run of you know um wizards of the coast bringing people in to talk about their products and things like that and and how people didn't like it or you shouldn't go if you if if uh it's just like that's so stupid um I don't think people should li neither like or hate Watsi. I think you should make up your own mind. And when you're given new information or new parameters, change your mind after that. So anyway, guys, thank you so much to every, everyone that takes part in the show. Um, as luckily, I, I broadcast so early that I don't, I'm not overloaded with the number of individuals that, that come to the show live. That being said, 
you may see me to start implementing something where I'm going to ask you to either type um, an all caps question or probably just DBJ in your comment to highlight them because it can get a little bit out of control if there's like double digit individuals in the live stream. But until that point, um, say what you got to say, do what you got to do. Everybody have a great day. I will see thee tomorrow for Level Up Advanced 5th Edition Tuesday. Peace.